you know, y'all who have been here before in this track, you've heard me say this, uh, but I'm going to continue to say it the rest of the day. We literally could not do uh, what we do here today uh, without uh, without the the sponsorship and support of these organizations. They didn't leave us. They could have. They could have said, we'll pull and we'll see you next year. Uh, but they have not done that. They have all stood with us. 100% of our sponsors have stayed with us the entire time. And so we're very grateful for that. And so I want to acknowledge them once again at the diamond level, Warner Media, uh, at the gold level, uh, my home college and my home department, the Kennesaw State University, Coles College of Business. That is the college that my department is located in. My department is the Department of Information Systems at Kennesaw State University. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read from my scripture that I wrote, Bishop Fox. We also have Coal Fire, Genuine Parts, and NCR, all of those uh, fine uh, organizations are sponsors at the gold level. Uh, at the silver level, um, we, uh, I'm sorry, at the, uh, at the crystal level, sorry, uh, some days it's tough to read after a long day. At the crystal level, we have uh, Critical Path and Synopsis, and we thank them for their sponsorship today. Uh, at the silver level, we have Aaron's Binary Defense. Uh, we also have Black Hills Information Security, as well as Core Light and Guide Point Security. Uh, coming in at the bronze level, uh, Rory and his nice uh, group, the NCC group, and Rory, once again, thank you for, for that presentation because everybody knows containers are scary stuff and we need to think about how we lock those things down. Um, moving on, uh, a couple of in-kind in sponsors. Uh, one was EC Council who provided uh, some uh, great training opportunities yesterday. Uh, with their reverse engineering and malware course, uh, as well as uh, Secure Code Warrior, who's been running uh, a CTF like Gangbusters over there in the CTF channel all day long. And uh, they've been running that CTF for us virtually, uh, and we, we thank them for, for that opportunity and their sponsorship and their offering of the CTF. Uh, we would also like to thank uh, a group of individuals and some organizations for contributing to our really nice pile of stuff to give away. Uh, in addition to the sponsors that we've already talked about here previously who have given us uh, some items, we had some other organizations and individuals who contributed uh, raffle prizes. So uh, I want to thank Mike Costa and Crosshair Information Technology for, for their contributions. Joe Gray for his gifts to give away offensive security, uh, as well as the pen tester lab. Uh, all of them contributed uh, nice items to give away that we've been giving away throughout the day and, and will continue to do so. Uh, I'm going to make uh, yet another pitch. Uh, we are global this year, and we want to know where you're, where you're coming to us from. And so we have created a map that will allow you to drop a pin and tell us where you are. Uh, and I am posting that link uh, in the track discussion channel. Uh, please take a minute and drop a pin in that map if you have not done so already. And take a look at the map and see where people uh, are coming from uh, today. It really truly is. If that information on the map is, is, is accurate, uh, we really are a global conference. And it, is, it has been something to see. Uh, happen today. Uh, also, a reminder that, as I mentioned previously, we do have raffles and giveaways happening all day long. Uh, there is a channel in the Slack workspace specifically devoted to that, and I'm going to drop that channel in the uh, in the track channel there, so it's there. Please, if you haven't done so already, go hit that channel and uh, and make sure that your name is in the mix uh, for one of these wonderful prizes that we've been giving out throughout the day. Um, additionally, we have a speaker's channel, uh, I'm sorry, a speaker, a sponsor's channel, uh, where the sponsors are out there and we would like for you to stop by and interact with them. And I'm typing that in now uh, in the track space uh, there so that uh, you can maybe take a few minutes and just drop by, interact with them, say thank you, because literally we could not have afforded to do what we've done today uh, virtually uh, without their support. So uh, we want to thank them for that. Um, 
trying to think. I think that that is about it. Uh, hiring and giving. I mean, we've got a lot of channels out there. I'm not going to bore you with all of them, but we've got a lot of different channels out there. If you're looking for a job, if you're offering, looking to fill a job, we've got a channel out there for that. We've got all kinds of chats, channels out there. People are posting pictures of their dogs today. I, even I'm in on it. So uh, that's all been happening. Um, and without that, uh, without uh, that, that's one of the big things about uh, virtual events like uh, like what we're doing today is that no, we're not having LobbyCon today. Uh, so we try and simulate that as best we can through these different channels in the Slack workspace. So um, if you uh, uh, if you are of a mind, please go interact and help folks with uh, you know whatever it is that they need help with. Whether, uh, you know. I'll let you go figure that out. You can you can sort all that out. Uh, I am getting some questions here. Bear with me just a minute. Let me see what's going on here. Um, yeah, thank you. I will absolutely do my best. Uh, I appreciate the guidance. Um, so what I will say at this point in time is that um, we hope that you have enjoyed the talk so far. Uh, we hope that they will uh, continue to keep you uh, to keep you entertained and informed. And uh, with that, uh, let me uh, stop sharing my screen. And um, I believe Eldon, have I moved you over to the panelist position? Yes, Eldon is there. And so, without further ado, we're going to bring on our next speaker, uh, Eldon Stiegel. Uh, will be talking will be about. Talking about uh, uh, Manual for manual for, manual for manual hurting, clouds, hurting clouds, free free, free tools free for, tools improved, for security. improved security. Eldon, take Eldon, it away. Take yeah. it away. Hey, can you hear me? Coming through good? Yes. Yes, just fine. Okay. Just awesome. Fine. Let me let me get yeah. All right. You can see my screen. Um <clears throat> so I yeah. guess uh up. Up. start out with uh a little bit about me. Um I've been kicking around um the Atlanta security adjacent startup scene for um, about 15 years, uh, doing things as diverse as, as uh, uh, VoIP, um, disaster recovery, uh, sometimes, um, you know, uh, threat feeds and things like that. Um, just depends, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I've um, worked at a, at a lot of different places in a relatively short amount of time, um, which, which I think has given me uh, some some unusual perspective um, about some of some of these uh, topics that we're discussing. Um, so I've been uh, security adjacent, I would say, for about 12 years, and then 10 years approximately working in the cloud. I'm in in AWS, making API calls just about every working day, and and some non-working days for sure. And uh, typically uh, smaller companies, so five people to to 500 people is kind of uh, you know where where I prefer to be. Uh, I find that you can really make an impact at a company that size, and um, but <laughs> there are trade-offs in terms of, of budget and staffing. So uh, why am I here? Um, I've, like I said, I've spent a lot of time in uh, in AWS. Um, you know, handled working at, at, at a five-person company, you kind of end up handling incident response. You know, <laughs> just just with a normal um, sort of being in a normal engineering role you end up handling incident response. And uh, you know, sometimes that doesn't have a lot of uh, training or context around it. Um, so uh, you know, this, this presentation is really, um, is, is kind of aimed at uh, introducing people who might not be super familiar with the cloud to the cloud, talking about uh, sort of the personal journey that I've been engaged in at, uh, the current, at my current role. Um, discussing uh, some specific uh, components of the cloud that are really hot spots for problems that, that organizations face. And then hopefully, uh, if, if the demo gods are, are uh, kind, we can actually bring up some, um, some tooling that, that we use and, and also um, just uh, some, some red flags that we can look for uh, to be ready um, you know, for, for these incidents. So. Um, without further ado, uh, what is a public cloud? If you've been in the bathroom for the past year or so, um, almost any business hosting on-demand provisioned infrastructure 
if you can log in and, and give them a credit card and, and rent a virtual machine from them, then that would be considered a public cloud. So AWS, Amazon, Google has GCP, Microsoft has Azure, um, also Packet, DigitalOcean, Oracle Cloud, and Rackspace are kind of the primary players in, in the area. One of the challenges that um, the cloud ecosystem has really encountered in the past uh, few years is, is this exponential growth in the number of services that a given cloud will offer. So kind of started out where it was just compute and object. So you think compute, you think AWS, EC2 instances, and object, you would think AWS, S3. Um, Google has cloud storage buckets and uh, GCP instances, um, databases, so Postgres, Redis, MySQL, and network. Um, one of the biggest challenges with networking is that, that most uh, public cloud providers have somewhat bespoke APIs to handle the network. Um, you know, it, I've, I've looked for, for years for kind of an IP tables to AWS security groups translator, and it's just not there. But in addition to, to these four kind of basic components, um, as we can see on this, on this, uh, on the AWS services offering, there are, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of additional services that you could potentially subscribe to, depending on how you want to slice it. So, um, and if you'll notice there on the right, uh, my favorite part is, is the scroll bar. You now have to scroll several pages potentially. So they have a search at the top. Um, this really kind of belies the, the complexity of, uh, the cloud providers and the services they offer. And it's very easy for a small organization. Uh, my current team is three people. It's very easy to sort of lose yourself in this variety of offerings. Okay, um, some of the differences now. Um, you know, before cloud, it wasn't uncommon for small organizations to, to have specific infrastructure and by infrastructure i mean specific machines for specific tasks you might be able to point at a server in a cabinet and say oh this is hosting the website or this is hosting the database um, on the other hand if you had compromise you could turn something off you could turn off the switch at the top of the rack to prevent to, that was that was a primitive form of, of data loss prevention you know, you could unplug a specific machine that you identified was compromised. Um, and the tricky part is if someone was DDoSing you, um, you probably noticed it and you, there were other challenges related to that. Um, so now today um, we have the cloud and the cloud kind of specializes in segmenting different components of the business. So if, Previously, everyone was on, you know, a, a, a VMware cluster or a, a, a small uh, set of, of hosts. Now, you know, almost every business unit seems to have the capability to deploy additional infrastructure, um, deploy maybe infrastructure that, that you might not have a security story around yet. Um, and that infrastructure can be hard to discover. Um, you know, AWS is, is an interesting example for exa because they, uh, they allow different accounts in an organization, and we'll look at that a little later. The, the challenge of different accounts in an organization is it's not necessarily true that the master account, the bill paying account, will be able to reach in to the child accounts in order to, uh, to, to identify what's going on in them. So, a lot of, of interesting complexity comes with that. So uh, coming from a software development background and, and kind of joining this security engineering team due to my, my cloud uh, experience, um, I, uh, you know, we were, a, we're a small team, we have a small budget. And uh, initially we were monitoring about approximately five to six uh, AWS accounts, uh, and and frequently you'll find AWS accounts laid out, you know, such that there's 
a development account, a, a staging account, a production account. Sometimes at different types of organizations, you'll see each individual developer with their own account. It really depends on how the organization is laid out. And um, so uh, for that, AWS specifically has developed uh, organizations. Uh, GCP has a similar abstraction, which is um, full project folders, and, and Azure also has uh, the concept of a resource group. Um, so we'll look at the, the AWS version in a little while. Um, today, we, we monitor over a thousand AWS accounts uh, with the strategy I'm, I'm going to talk about at the end. Uh, we're constantly revising our security posture. So. Um, one of the challenges with, with all these released services is um, the services are changing as fast as, as Amazon or, or Google can write new code. <laughs> and, and some of those changes are, are easy to incorporate into a security posture, but many are very, very challenging. Um, the other is uh, we've seen in our organization and also uh, from customers, we've seen this rapid movement to Kubernetes um, which you know was was discussed previously, um, and uh, I'm going to to try to give a, a quick highlight of, of some of the tooling that you can use from the other side to uh, to detect and and potentially remediate some of the the findings there. So um, the first choice you need to make is choosing how to monitor. Uh, monitor needs to be familiar to the industry. Uh, the, our product is a product that's uh, sold to uh, many enterprises, and so we needed something that would fit in with those enterprises that they could uh, sort of pick up and um, you know choose to, to inform themselves or not inform themselves on. So. Uh, we kind of thought about our different strategies, bespoke security strategies we considered doing. Um, the problem is they take time to document. And when you're working closely with customer security teams, that documentation, you're gonna land on your feet much, much more readily if you can point to something that's on the public internet and something that, that um, their security team may already have some familiarity with. Uh, vendors are kind of an easy choice, um, but uh, I'll talk a, a little bit about some of the challenges that we reached with our vendors. Um, you know, they, they always <laughs> seem to, to, to sell uh, a full package and then you install the package and, and very rarely does it work for you without additional investment. Of course, as a small security team, the, the reason you're paying them money is to avoid having to invest too much. So uh, it's, it's really uh, a, a rock and a hard place kind of scenario in, in some cases. Uh, also, uh, we really wanted uniform monitoring adopt across different public clouds. So we have been inter integrating with other, with customer clouds for three to four years now, pretty closely. And in that time, we've seen you know, all of the top uh, public clouds that customers were very insistent upon running in. And uh, we've seen a variety of smaller clouds as well. Uh, and so deciding how to manage that both from a, uh, the perspective of a security team and the supportability of an individual cloud, because all of these clouds operate differently. So that is one of the big drivers towards Kubernetes. Um, because all of these providers have Kubernetes offerings. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the vendor candidates and some of the challenges that we experience with them. And then I'm gonna uh, sort of jump right into what we settled on. So vendor names redacted clearly, but um, you know, and, and these are, are sort of amorphous vendors in that they, we clearly interviewed more than three vendors um, for some of these needs, and these were kind of pretty consistent um, themes that we saw across our uh, investigation. So uh, some vendors can be acquired by larger companies, um, and the product capabilities can stagnate. They kind of get the directive from the top to 
you've built it, we bought it, now go out and sell it. Um, so in that, uh, we experienced frequent high touch meetings, you know, people specifically uh, sales and support folks that wanted to get a lot of feedback, but then uh, unfortunately that feedback very rarely flowed quickly into uh, useful capabilities in the tooling. Um, we had other vendors that were slow to respond to support requests, and that can be a real issue if, uh, if you have a support request that may be related to a finding where you're unsure what the, the necessary remediation is or if you don't know how to turn it off, if you don't know how to mute it. Uh, one of the things that's very common at smaller organizations is something called alert fatigue. So if you work on a small team and you have any kind of paging system, uh, make sure to think about that. Uh, so with, with some vendors, they would generate alerts. We couldn't effectively shut them off. And um, that just proved to be unwieldy for us. Uh, often vendors have very complicated user interfaces. So much so that they expect you to attend many trainings um, in order to kind of leverage their tooling. Uh, and then uh, some of it is also AI based, which meant that it wasn't really explainable. Um, you know, we would ask in a support case, why did this happen? And they would say, I don't know, we've had our AI look at all of your data and we don't know. <laughs> so um, after a lot of time invested in, in looking at vendors, um, we kind of went with none of them. And, and I think that's been the best for us. Uh, but it was useful in that we got a, an overview of what the industry is looking like. Um, so through talking with our vendors and seeing the features that they did inter introduce, we often identified uh, strategies that other companies were interested in because we knew that those vendors were talking to their customers and those other companies were making a request to the vendor. So that really helped us to plan our path forward insofar as implementing our internal solutions to these monitoring strategies. Um, so one of the big ones, and, and I think it was just mentioned uh, in the Kubernetes talk and may have also been mentioned earlier, is uh, the CIS benchmarks. CIS has been uh, releasing benchmarks for years. I believe they're, they're a nonprofit organization. Um, don't quote me on that. But, uh, but all of their benchmarks are available, uh, or many, many are available for free on their website. So you go, you register, you download, and, um, and you can do this. And it's also, it gives a lot of third party credence. So you can say to a customer security team, um, you know, we're running these CIS benchmarks and they can go read the benchmarks for themselves without you having to generate any additional documentation. So CIS, in recent years, after uh, Windows and, and Linux and printers, um, well, all of which they have benchmarks for, they now have benchmarks for Amazon, GCP, Azure. And very recently, I think within the last year, they re released uh, uh, Kubernetes benchmarks. So um, the, we found these benchmarks to give really good guidance on how to ensure that your system is uh, following best practices and isn't going to be as likely to fall victim to, to some of the attacks that are common in a cloud scenario. So after a lot of evaluation, we uh, we sort of settled on open source. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's scratch software in a lot of ways, so it's implemented by people that need to generate these findings and need to remediate them. Um, it's released by practitioners who have sort of public personas and are real people that you can talk to at uh, conferences like these. Um, they're uh, really important components are that the, the, these assessment tools are debuggable by users. So a good example is Prowler. Um, so I think Prowler may have been mentioned earlier, but it's a tool that you can use to assess the security posture of uh, an AWS account. 
and uh, you can just kind of locally run it on your machine and it does a great job. Uh, and it's geared towards specifically the CIS benchmarks for AWS. Uh, we found using Prowler that it was actually targeting more recent benchmarks. So CIS benchmarks are updated with some regularity. Uh, and we had several vendors that were targeting um, AWS uh, 1.1 benchmarks, which were about four years old. At the rate that cloud technologies are advancing, if you're four years out of date, that's like being, that's like running, you know, a Linux version that's two major re releases behind, you know, it's, it's, it's like running, uh, you know, 3.2 or something of the Linux kernel. It's, it's a, can be a big problem. Um, so these open source tools, you know, of course, we could identify bugs in them. We could even contribute enhancements if we wanted to. And I actually identified a bug in, in Prowler and then uh, put it on my to-do list. And two weeks later, I went to see that it was already fixed um, by someone, you know, completely unrelated. And, you know, that's a huge win where, uh, you know, we would sometimes see weeks or months uh, of turnaround time to even identify an issue or confirm that it actually was an issue for some of our vendors. So with our strategy, we sort of started gathering the different bits that we would use. Um, so uh, these are just links to, to a couple of different suites of tools. Uh, Prowler um, is a common one for assessing uh, AWS. Um, so Python, and, and it's typically run from the command line, but I'll talk a little bit about how we modified that approach for our purposes. Cloud Custodian is one that's uh, primarily driven by Capital One, and it's uh, a very comprehensive tool set. It's also written in Python, and uh, you know all of these are just uh, links to uh, GitHub pages, so uh, you can just go in and, and see the, the code, you can commit to it, you can see how recently it was updated. So you know all of these tools, are very actively maintained, which really gave us a lot of warm fuzzies when we were trying to, to select what our tooling was going to look like as we uh, approached this task. Like I said, uh, Prowler, there's a lot of shell, there's some Python. Um, Cloud Custodian is primarily Python. Uh, because our uh, organization is adopting Kubernetes pretty aggressively, we decided to trial KubeBench as well. And this was one of the places where, uh, you know, we really also saw that benefit of transparency and, and community involvement. We had several vendors that were running uh, the CIS Kubernetes benchmarks. An interesting change happened when you were deploying the Kubelet, which is, uh, I think it was just previously discussed, but a lot of configuration elements got switched from command line parameters to a config file. It was very challenging because our vendor would alert on all of these missing command line parameters because of the way that they were doing the evaluation. And so alert alarms were going off everywhere saying that our Kubernetes was insecure when in fact, uh, rather than looking at the command line parameters, you just needed to look at the config file. So, um, you know, that was uh, a place where really a vendor solution became unworkable for us because there were so many alerts that, that we knew were false positives and we didn't have a good way to filter those out at that time without doing substantial work on our side. Uh, NCC group, so uh, sort of, apropos of the previous speaker, I believe, um, released Scout Suite. Uh, it's a, a multi-cloud auditing tool, and I'm very excited to see the development of it. Uh, it's, it's relatively, uh, it's evolving a little differently from, um, you can see that uh, uh, it's, it's been changing periodically um, as far as which uh, which products and which repos are actually uh, active. Uh, but uh, I'm very excited about it because it 
will hopefully have a much broader purview as far as the number of clouds. You know, Prowler is, is kind of primarily AWS based and we definitely um, are interested in uh, a solution that is a single platform that covers all three of these uh, service providers. So once we had kind of gathered this set of tooling, we had to decide how to run it. So for the size and number of our AWS accounts, we thought about Lambda. The problem with Lambda, um, Lambda is an AWS service, which lets you run effectively little short, shortly lived snippets of code. And so what we discovered was that many of the processes we were running here, Prowler, Cloud Custodian, KubeBench, they could all um, take much longer on our suite of accounts than uh, Lambda really uh, was economical to run. Um, could run it locally, and at the beginning we did run it locally uh, to kind of get our baselines for what, what, what our immediate remediations were for these tools. Um, we could set it up on EC2 instances, but as I said, from our uh, as our number of accounts grew, scaling up those, that set of EC2 instances and distributing the work between them was really uh, too, too challenging. Uh, so finally, we decided to get our feet wet in Kubernetes. Uh, K -S, K S is a common uh, abbreviation for Kubernetes. Um, so uh, several other organizations primarily development organizations within our uh, company had started trialing different uh, aspects of Kubernetes. And there were a lot of things that we really liked about it. Uh, Kubernetes is very, uh, specifically EKS on Amazon, it's very straightforward to get logs out of it. So for Prowler, for example, um, it's just a command line parameter to get JSON output from Prowler. So we decided to leverage that along with CloudWatch logs and CloudWatch logs really almost built in strategy to connect to Elasticsearch. Um, we decided to leverage that in order to really get a, a dashboard of what our data was looking like at a given time. Uh, Elasticsearch can also serve as a sync for additional data. So um, you know, it was a very, I think Elasticsearch is a, a very common component of sort of these bespoke and uh, open source uh, seams. So, uh, you know, uh, I believe there's Elk Hunter um, and, and Mozilla released an Elasticsearch based uh, security tool as well. Um, we looked at a number of those tools and decided that um, our team was too small to manage something on the scale of, of Elk Hunter, for example. Um, so we, we decided to just go with a, a straightforward Elasticsearch service and then um, leverage Lambda for alerts and remediations. So I can give a quick example. Um, so, so our final Kubernetes strategy was to set up uh, a cron job. Kubernetes has the concepts of cron jobs. Uh, cron job, it sounds like it's, uh, in, you know, uh, a sysadmin strategy from, from the 90s. And in many ways, it's if it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, so Kubernetes cron jobs are configured for each AWS account in our organization. And what that means is that the for a given AWS account, uh, Prowler, uh, Cloud Custodian, KubeBench, can all be run on the resources in that account to give us a baseline for an account on a given day. And um, this really lets us get a historical perspective, which we can provide um, in the case of, of audits. Uh, so uh, you might provide this in, in the context of a SOC audit uh, for certain uh, compliance, uh, certain controls you might have in place. Uh, and then uh, one of the other nice elements of, of using CloudWatch logs is you can subscribe lambdas to the logs and then the lambdas can also be the code that in, the, in case of automatic re remediation 
can remediate directly. So you could imagine someone creates an S3 bucket. Now, if you create an S3 bucket, it's very easy to set it to be public or to be configured and inappropriately. Uh, one of the, the controls that we try to have in place for our customers is, is encryption. So S3 bucket encryption is something that we enable by default. And when someone creates an S3 bucket that's not encrypted, we can remediate that very straightforwardly. Prowler scans the account, generates the JSON log files. We are listening for the JSON log files in CloudWatch and Lambda can identify that create account bucket can go check to see if create account event can go check and see if that bucket is encrypted and encrypt it if necessary. It's kind of a high level overview of how this all works for us. So uh, before I get down into the demos, I'd like to, to serve as a kind of, I'd like to t tell a cautionary tale about cloud spend. Cloud spend can get very expensive very quickly. And uh, a good example is something as simple as S3 bucket replication. If you are replicating an S3 bucket from one region to another region, which is a best practice, by the way, um, then that transfer can get expensive. Those a API calls can get expensive. Every time a new object ends up in a bucket in US East 1 and is replicated to another bucket in US West 2, there's a cost associated with that, with the API calls, with the, uh, with the, the data transfer. And so, um, you know, I, if you haven't heard of, of uh, Corey Quinn, uh, cloud economist, I would really recommend checking out. And if you're involved in, in uh, cloud monitoring at all, I would really recommend checking out his, uh, his blog. Uh, he also has a podcast. And uh, it really can, can give some great tips on how to mitigate some of that uh, hidden cost. So the easiest thing to do is, is really to set up cost monitoring. We can do it in about 10 minutes, and, and it's very straightforward. I'll actually demo that here in a moment if, if the demo gods are kind. And uh, the best part is we can use cost monitoring to find potential security issues. Uh, so a good example, sort of uh, springboarding off of, of the previous presentation, if you saw it, uh, it was about Kubernetes and using distributed uh, uh, remote code execution as a service to, to, for example, mine Monero. So as a company, you can get into a very challenging situation where you have an auto scaling group and when the Kubernetes cluster is busy, it adds more workers to address that additional load. So if you have auto scaling set up in a very permissive way and someone decides to deploy some kind of crypto miner on that, you could end up with a cloud bill that's enormous because your auto scaling group is scaled all the way up actually adding more instances to mine more crypto for an attacker. So cost monitoring, um, which can also uh, sort of give you a, an insight into uh, data egress because you pay for every cent that you send out of AWS. Data egress can really get, give you a very in, deep insight into what kind of activities are happening in your system. Um, all right, so I'm going to sacrifice a coffee bean and a mechanical keyboard here and try to do some uh, just a quick walkthrough and, and a demonstration of, of some of the tooling that, that we're using. So um, let me switch windows that I'm sharing here.
So this is actually uh, an AWS account. This is not my company's AWS account. <laughs> this is this is my AWS account. Uh, let's see, is that is that coming through? Yeah. Um, and so uh, you can see how how easy it is to actually run in a foul of some of these recommendations. So. One moment. Did we lose Elden? No, I'm, I'm still here. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. I'm just. Okay. I'm just. Sorry, I'm. I'm doing uh, some uh, window reworking. Here we go. So this is an example of what you get kind of out of the box with that workflow that I discussed earlier. Um, so we have, this is Kibana, which is uh, the default front end of uh, Elasticsearch. And these are actually uh, guard duty events that are coming in. So guard duty is a, it's a useful service that AWS offers. Uh, it's one of those places where you have to be a little careful about spin, as with uh, other other AWS sort of focused uh, components. But uh, just you know, with literally about 15 clicks, you can have guard duty going into uh, an AWS uh, cloud trail, which goes into uh, Kibana here, and we can get these great dashboards. Uh, which tell us things about, um, you know, the number, the location, uh, and, and we can really dig way far down in here if we want to, uh, to, to identify what exactly is going on. Um, and this is really out of the box. Uh, let's see. Let's switch over to... The screen. So these are the kinds of alerts that you might find, and, and they're visible here. Um, if you can see the uh, the access key age, there, um, you know these are old. And what what this an access key in AWS for those folks that don't know is is kind of the equivalent of a username and password. So you know you have an access key ID. You have a date it was created, a date it was last used. And this is very useful because it shows us that we're really not using this credential. So to make it inactive is as simple as a click. And this is also something that you could automatically do with a Lambda. Yeah. Uh, now, Lambdas are not free, but uh, if you're already running a Kubernetes cluster, you could also integrate a script into your Kubernetes cr cluster that just takes the Prowler output and does something very similar. Also, what I've got here are AWS organizations. So this is kind of how you end up organizing AWS accounts. You have uh, an email, an account name, an account ID, status, and you can actually organize these into groupings uh, called organizational units, and then you can apply uh, restrictions based on those organizational units. Unfortunately, one of the challenges is when you apply a restriction based on an organizational unit, uh, you end up limiting the activities inside an account, and it's very common for a development organization to say, we can't have any of our activities limited, we're trying to move too fast here. So that's kind of the concept. Now, many people will use AWS users. Really, there's a, a much better way, which is to use AWS roles. So frequently, what will happen is uh, you want to do some kind of activity based on 
uh, and, and you want to change some other AWS service, and you want that code to be running in a Lambda or on an EC2 instance. So as you can see, uh, there's this concept of AWS roles, which you can apply to a Lambda, to spot fleet, to an EC2 instance. And this AWS role is, is like a user in that you can um, give it permissions, but the, those credentials that we looked at under the users, those are automatically provided to the EC2 instances or to the Lambda code. And uh, it means that you really aren't at risk. Um, when you have users that have very old passwords or very long access key ages, then there's always the risk that those access keys can walk out the door. Um, one of the worst scenarios that I observed was uh, we actually had, um, at one company I worked at, we had a solutions architect which had, who had access keys, which he mistook into a customer account. He mistook those access keys for access keys to his personal development account and basically went in and deleted a number of the, um, the resources in that customer account. Uh, fortunately, we were able to recover 100%, but uh, you know, it's, it's just a sort of, you know, uh, 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 the moral of the story is that, that these have danger and it's very easy for them to get uh, created, circumvented, and forgot, forgotten about if you don't have this kind of monitoring in place. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show briefly going slightly off the script here, so demo guys be kind. CloudWatch logs. So this is this is a simple billing alarm that I've set up. Uh, show it's in alarm right now and it shows that this account has spent 140 bucks this month in AWS. So not cheap, but you know, if, if you need to learn something, it might be worth doing it. That said, if, if you are very budget sensitive, set up an, an alarm like this you know, early. If you're using an account, if you're using the AWS free, free tier and you don't expect to be spending money, go ahead and set this alert up initially, and, and there are guides to set this alert up so that you know when you're spending money. The other very powerful thing is CloudWatch logs. Many, uh, do I have any? Many services will send things to CloudWatch logs automatically. So this is, for example, uh, a flow log. If you are looking for something that you might traditionally get from a network appliance as far as uh, network flows, Amazon has the same thing. And this is a really good example because enabling network flows is a part of the CSI recommendation suite. So Prowler will iterate through all of your VPCs. A VPC in AWS is kind of like a virtual compute uh, network, right? So it, you could think of it as almost like a VLAN and um, it, and so, you can turn on logging for every network connection in a given VLAN. So here we can see this network interface, which is connected to a specific virtual machine, contacted these network addresses during this time period. Uh, and in this case, that connection was rejected. Here, that connection, this connection was accepted. But this is something that is one of the specific recommendations and I've used these logs, you know, during multiple, uh, you know, investigations to identify the specific machines that were uh, involved in the potential breach. And actually, it's 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 not uncommon that you can do a lot of narrowing down in this kind of scenario. Oh, only one of these fields is bytes sent, and you know, if you see, oh, only you know, 123 bytes were sent. Okay. There's no way that 123 bytes, no way, you know, <laughs> this is a strong statement, but there's no way that 123 bytes could trigger the problem that we're expecting to be, to, to be investigating for. So, um, so that's kind of a high level overview of CloudWatch logs, flow logs. 
these are tremendously useful in, in, in my day-to-day -day operations. Uh, or AWS organization is also very useful. Um, image credits, of course these slides will be available. Um, can I answer, let me switch over to, to Slack and I can, uh, Yeah, while well, Eldon's yeah, well, bouncing over, over the check, Slack out, check Slack out. Uh, any questions, uh, any questions for, uh, for, uh, for Eldon? Uh, Eldon. P. Wallace, uh, I see you. P. Wallace, I see you. Uh, Zoom uh, webinar. Zoom, please post uh, webinar. your questions in the please Slack channel. Please post your questions channel. in the Slack uh, so channel. So everybody can take a look at it there. Uh, so everybody can take a look at it there. Yes, I'm not yes, sure I'm what, not that, sure is. what that is. Yes, I'm not sure what that is. Is there anything that, that uh, folks would be interested in, in seeing specifically uh, while I'm here? I can walk through actually creating a VPC and, and setting up those flow logs really quick from the command line if that's something that would be interested and nobody has anything else then that's, that's what I'll do. Sure, okay. So every Almost every AWS object lives inside of a VPC. Uh, like I said, you can think of a VPC as a sort of a VLAN for AWS. So when you create a VPC, you're going to give it a name, uh, file walkthrough, VPC flow logs, for example. Uh, we can Just pick one. Now it's very important to uh, to choose something, and and really in your organization to have a network plan in place because there's something called VPC peering. VPC peering uh, is a part of the CIS recommendations, but it's you know you don't really think about it often, but it's not hard. It's actually very easy to set up VPCs in such a way that they do have overlapping. Uh, CIDR, internal CIDRs, and in that kind of scenario, you may have trouble peering two VPCs together. All right, we created a VPC. It's worth noting that VPCs are free, uh, flow logs are not. So if you expect to have a lot of a lot of traffic, uh, you may you may want to think about what what destination you're using for flow logs. So uh, accept, reject, all. We can, we can try any of these. Um, accept and reject are based on uh, potentially other factors, but they're primarily based on the security groups that you assign to a network interface. Uh, so in this case, we'll just do accept. Uh, this is the maximum aggregation interval. So that's kind of the the maximum amount of time you might wait to get alerted on an event. Uh, we're going to send them to CloudWatch logs. We'll use the flow logs. Um, and and uh, so this is an example where we're assigning an IAM role. The thing that we're assigning this IAM role for is for the flow log service on Amazon's part to be able to deliver the logs to S3. So Amazon has a number of built-in uh, IAM roles. You can see CloudTrail uh, flow logs role is one that I've created. 
The challenge with the built-in ones, you have to be really careful because AWS makes it easy. They don't make it specific. So you can use one of these roles granted to a system or a Lambda, and that Lambda could have much broader permissions than what you expect. There's actually a, a, a blog post that I would recommend anybody who's involved with this reading called, uh, M I think it's AWS's most dangerous API, and it's about IAM role creation. Uh, so flow log role. And then we can add tags here um, to the flow log. I'm not going to do that. And that flow log is, has been created. So we should be able to go to this destination and uh, these flow logs will be, will be streaming in. Now we, we, we would need to actually have a, an instance in that VPC. So we, we could create an instance And you know, I'm. I think Amazon's most dangerous capability is really the user interface here, because when you're running one of these wizards, there is so much going on under the hood, so much going on that um, it's very hard to replicate all of those steps that this wizard is doing. And unless you have somebody sitting there doing like a, a screen recording of what they're doing. Um, so here we can pick our new VPC. Oh, we need to create a new subnet. And this is what I was talking about, like kind of what's, what's going on under the hood. So availability zone, we'll just you know, pick anyone, uh, give it a cider block. So I highly recommend, and, and I think other uh, speakers have discussed previously, um, Terraform is a capability uh, to avoid, and let's see, this should. Okay, so now we have a subnet and a bunch of de defaults. This is where we could assign an IAM role. So we can assign an IAM role here, and this EC2 instance will actually get the uh, the permissions that are granted to this IAM role. So if we went to our IAM console, we would be able to identify that IAM role, and then it's going to have a, a number of policies associated to it, and we can actually look at those policies. Here, this one uh, allows you to, to put a message on a queue. So um, this was actually uh, a project to get some information on spot pricing, which is Amazon's kind of discount pricing for AWS. Um, and, uh, and then once we've done this, we can basically launch it. One of the things that you'll find a CIS benchmark for is key pairs. Um, making sure that your key pairs aren't excessively out of date is, is an important thing because, um, you know, if, if uh, some employee creates a key pair, uses it to launch a bunch of instances, walks away, um, it's a double-sided uh, sort of challenge because that key pair is on that instance and you don't know if that key has walked out the door. Also, you don't know if that employee who created the instances necessarily shared the key pair out. Uh, this is one of the reasons that, that we've been a, a aggressively adopting Kubernetes is because you, you have the potential to avoid this specific problem. Um, okay, I think I am running, I think that is pretty much uh, the end of my time. Yep, so we're I'm, right, I'm up happy to, right up against it. I'm happy to chat any more about this on Slack or questions later. Um, I'm also almost always at the 2600 and, and DC 404 uh, meetings. So, uh, yeah, feel free to, to hit me up anywhere. Thanks.